The following is a presentation of the Belly Up Sports Media Network. What's good, everybody? It's your boy Jay here with the Sooner or Later Sports Show. We got a little special episode popular for all of you today. We got Colin Kennedy from 247, the man himself, the man, the myth, the legend. We decided to pull up an early episode for you all here on this Wednesday. Colin, what's going on, man? Thanks for pulling up as usual. I mean, I'm better now, right? We can talk <laughs> ball with, with one of my guys. And <laughs> hey, look, it's OU Texas week, folks, right? Like, the only thing that makes this game better is fried butter, Fletcher's corn dogs, and oh. a whole lot of tension in the air. So I'm looking forward to this, man. This is one of the best times of the year. It really is. And like you said, the 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 tension is gonna be you can cut it with a knife when you get down to I plan on, I'm gonna be in Dallas. So I'll be floating around the fairgrounds. We're going to the game this year for the first time in a very long time. And so, man, I'm excited. It's hate Texas week, guys. Hate Texas week. I'll be on the um, uh, SEC Connect later on today, later on tonight with the Texas guy. So we're going to go back and forth and talk about who's better and who's not. And we'll talk about that at that point. But right now, Colin, let's open this up for the people. The people want to know. We got to talk recruiting. I want to talk recruiting to open things up because there today was a busy day of crystal balls. Huh. I'm just going to say that there's a lot of them that just decide to fly down. And so one of them you put out was Marcus James linebacker at Carl Albert high school. He's at 25, but he's a big kid, man. Talk to us. I know you have an article out, but give us a little synopsis and something to tease people to go read that bad boy as to why Marcus James, wh wh where's the confidence coming from on that? Uh, there's a lot of things, right? I mean, if you want to see the full article, we're running two months for one dollar right now on 24/7 Sports. So get on it. I would encourage Oklahoma fans to go join Sooners Illustrated right now because you can get two whole months of content for a dollar. That's but, I, I think that's called smart finances. But as far as smart takes, that's Marcus James. I, I think that this dude is. I mean, especially when you put it within the context of an in-state recruit, right? Th this is as good as it gets for Oklahoma. I think, look, we don't have him ranked yet at 24-7, but there's a reason for that. We're obviously very little – we're a little bit hesitant to slap initial rankings on a guy without getting things like verified measurables from college camps, testing, track and field numbers, game tape. So Marcus is going to get his official rating, but – I put it on our board today. Like this is a guy with a serious four-star ceiling, in my opinion. Six three, already about two hundred and ten pounds, probably up to about six four. We were talking about it in the pre-show. I mean, he's he just keeps getting bigger. And I think you look at the frame; he's already two ten, two fifteen. Wouldn't be surprised if he's already up to two hundred and twenty pounds. But I think at, at at the full operating ceiling, this guy's six four. 240 plus pounds at the next level. Oklahoma has told him you can play inside linebacker. You can play cheetah. You can, you can go out there and you're going to have a defensive line in front of you. That's going to open plays up for you at the second level. And I, look, there, there are guys that I get to know on the recruiting trail, right? Who I, I always kind of separate their opinion, make that a distinction to know whether or not this kid is actually a really darn good football player. Right. One of my guys out there is Donnie Bags. Played at Texas A&M, was like a, a standout linebacker for the Aggies, then went to play for the Dallas Cowboys in the NFL. And Donnie called me one time and was like, have you heard about this Marcus James kid in Oklahoma? And I was hmm. like, have I heard about him? And Donnie <laughs> Bags says, them. well, a lot of people are going to hear about him a whole bunch more because this kid is a freak. And so when guys like that start – piping up and, and telling you like, Hey, this dude is for real. That just kind of is a testament to the talent that Marcus James has. And I look, it doesn't hurt that he's on this Carl Albert team with Kevin Sperry and Xavier Robinson. Probably not, but overall, I just think Oklahoma's coaching staff has done a really good job of recruiting this guy. And, and especially when he was on campus in the past, they, they continue to build on that relationship. That's already present. I like that. I like that. Okay. That's a, that's good connections that's saying, hey, that I w I've watched him. I've gone to Carl Albert and watched a few of the games there. A lot of you know my son goes to high school there. And so I've gone and checked it out. And I'm just like, goodness, that he's huge. Like he's a huge human being. And so 
the fact that you said that he can play both, either linebacker or even cheetah, he has the opportunity for it. God. Yeah, that's that's gonna be some good stuff. That's gonna be some good stuff. Now, on, next on that list, you had uh, Daniel Akinkumi, yep. the uh, the London, the number one player in London, which I love that uh, at the yeah. NFL Academy or whatnot. But no, he's a pretty nimble, large, athletic player. Like he did his vlog on his YouTube channel. Go check it out. Uh, by the way, the link to get two months of two four seven for only a buck is in the description below. I just added it. Make sure you go click on that link and um, take advantage and read these articles by Colin. But Daniel has, he's shown nothing but Oklahoma love. So I wasn't yeah. surprised by this one, but what made you go ahead and just throw that out there? What made me throw it out there now is I had been sitting on it for like two months. And then I just was like, for business opportunities, the week of OU Texas, thought I'd go ahead and finally put this pick in. Now, look, here's a little context about me, right? And why it makes sense, by the way, to go subscribe to Sooners Illustrated, two months, $1. Again, a lot of our subscribers know I don't like crystal balls. I think it kind of defeats the purpose. I want to give fans who are paying customers the first intel, and then a while later, then the rest of the world gets to figure it out. And especially in this day and age of, oh, one crystal ball went in, Twitter accounts everywhere are going to pull that, copy, paste it into a tweet, and garner all these retweets for themselves. Like, right. I would rather Oklahoma fans – who are interested in getting that insider intel, learn about this first. And, and our subscribers at Sooners Illustrated knew really since like July, I was like, yeah, this, this is Oklahoma. And the one thing that was really concerning to me following July was that he was at least slated at the time to go check out a couple other programs that made a lot of sense. Clemson, Michigan was in contact with him. It, it increased as the days were going by. Miami was in there as well. So there were a couple other big-name programs who wanted Daniel to take official visits there as well. But, I mean, when Daniel Akinkumi goes to Norman, Oklahoma, and experiences first college football game in person, I mean, that atmosphere alone for a lot of us still stands out. If that's your first as a recruit – uh, it's definitely going to stick a little bit. And then getting to know guys like Mike Hawkins and Danny Okoye, other other names who probably are not only pretty cool to get to know, but are very relatable and outgoing individuals. And then he has like what Wagyu beef for the first time in his life on his Oklahoma official visit. Right. I mean, well, right, you got to figure out the creative angles if you're OU staff, right? I mean, Anyway, this this was one that, especially after that official visit, and he ended up canceling basically every other trip afterwards. I mean, the crystal ball was only a matter of when did I want to drop it. So I, I figured it would be a good way to, to give Oklahoma fans a little bit more amp during OU Texas week. Not that they need it, right? I mean, this is going to be a guy, though, who eventually he decides next week, I believe next Thursday around 5 or 6 o'clock Central Time. Right. And I think that it, as all things currently track, unless a school over the next week or so picks up the phone and makes things interesting, OU's in a really good position here. And like you mentioned it, he also makes a lot of sense for Oklahoma. Like, does Daniel Akinkumi think OU makes sense for him? Yes. OU, though, looks at this guy and says, 6'5, 300 plus pounds, can play literally all five positions if he would like to athletic, buildable, moldable, still raw. Like you bring him in and you can literally shape him the way you want him to look as an offensive lineman. He's out there at the NFL Academy, so he has a very good baseline knowledge. But the, the fun thing and why international recruiting is really picked up is that college coaches say, we, we look at these guys, they have all the natural traits, but because the in-depth knowledge of the sport isn't necessarily there yet, we can bring them in and teach them the game the way we want to teach them. And that's that's an incredible advantage, and I think it's why it works out well for both parties involved Is if this is the move that ultimately happens. No, that makes sense. And he's like the perfect type of player for Bill Biedenboe. He's the yeah. type of guy that Biedenboe takes and shapes. I mean, Tyler Guyton's my favorite one. That's, of course, recent and right now 
hell, he's in conversations of first round capabilities because the dude's a beast. Yeah. But he came in so raw from TCU. What he was a defensive lineman at TCU, moved around, he played, um, played a little bit of O line, but he also caught a touchdown. Which when yeah. I saw Big Man be nimble, Big Man got me. I got excited about Big Man, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. you get. And so, uh, and can Kumi be one of those guys that's as like you said, as size as he is and as raw? Yeah, this is gonna be this is the mold, the clay that beating Bo loves to mold into potential day one or day two picks. So yeah, I'm excited about that one. All right. I gotta ask this one though. Um put a video out earlier yesterday to be exact. We got a 2026 commitment. <laughs> did anybody even see this happening? Where did I, uh, this come from? I'll tell you this. I'll, I'll read a text that I got from a source at Oklahoma when it went down. So if you don't know who we're talking about, Jonathan Hatton out there at Cibolo Steel in the San Antonio area, 2026 running back. I Look, this is a damn good football player. I don't care who wants to look at you and say, oh, it's just a 2026. This kid is a freak. And this is this is what I got. I, it was huge. No one knew he was committing, end quote. It truly sprung a lot of people by surprise. Now, here's the thing. The day of, did it catch some people off guard? Absolutely. Was this something that was maybe in the works for a while, though? I personally believe so. Yeah. I mean, when, when Jonathan Hatton comes out to an OU camp, and within the literally the first 10 minutes, I was standing there watching him. I'm like, he's got an offer. I mean, he he's that kind of kid. Makes sense. Once somebody... Once like somebody jumped in my comments and said that he kind of reminds him like Herschel Walker, the way he runs. And I was like, oh. Look, turn on the tape. Like, he he does not care at all. Like, he doesn't have any flash. This dude, what I said in the article I wrote, when you want to talk about a true north to south runner with zero wasted movement, who, who really does not give a damn if it's little Timmy on a Friday night and grandma's in the house to watch their first game, like, he will run through you. And I, I, I think that Jonathan Hatton, look, we already have him at what? Number 79 in the country. Right. In, in the class of 2026. I mean, look, all, every single highlight you're about to watch from his huddle is just him figuring out the fastest way to run forward and hurt somebody. And I love that. I, I mean, you watch a lot of running backs. Look, look at him go. I mean, it, and, and that's the thing too, is he's got great contact balance. He drives through his shoulder pads and moves those legs. So it doesn't matter who's coming after him. You have to meet him at the point of contact. And look, I mean, look at him. He does, he does not care that that kid's grandma is in the building. He doesn't care. <laughs> and so I think that Jonathan Hatton is someone who Oklahoma fans, even though he's a sophomore, but that's the flip side of the coin. This is a sophomore. I mean, he is a sophomore with all the talent in the world. And I mean, I don't understand how he does this stuff at that age. And so – when you look at him, he's at a power program. He has a teammate that is Oklahoma's involved with. He is already a representative for Oklahoma in that cycle. And he's already a very highly rated player. And I have reason to believe he's going to continue to rise in the rankings. Jonathan Hatton is a huge get in my eyes. And I really like the player. I like the fit as well. I think he's the perfect kind of back for Jeff Levy. And overall, he's just my kind of running back. And I think yeah. Oklahoma fans are really going to like it. Yeah, he's a north and south guy, as you can see, and, and and he he has the ability to cut when needed, but he likes to run people over. Like you said, he's a punishing runner, and it's definitely it's starting to fit kind of the type that Demarco Murray is starting to look for. He he wants two, so you add him, and honestly, I think the other back in that class most likely is going to be Caden Jones. You know, uh, Kiwan Jones' son up in Jinx, Oklahoma, um, big, tall, more scrawny but more agile back that. You put those two back there together, you've got your thunder and lightning. And if that seems to be what DeMarco Murray is going for in both of his classes, he wants a punisher, he wants a speedster, and then he wants, sometimes if he goes for a third, he'll get someone as versatile that they can throw at wide receiver at slot, you know, kind of like the uh, the Gavin Freeman type setup. But yeah, that's a sophomore. That's right, Cap, that's a sophomore. And the whole time we've been talking, I haven't seen him run like a, a pitch play once. You know what I Not mean? Once. Like every single snap, he's running straight downhill. And even when he's asked to attack to the tackles outside shoulder, for example, he's still figuring out the fastest way he can finally turn the ball up. And so 
I, I think Jonathan Hatton, the other part of this too is like, yes, he is an incredibly talented sophomore. But you, first of all, it never hurts when you pick up a commitment. But this guy is someone who a lot of people know in the state of Texas. Royal Capel, who was just in Norman for the Iowa State game, is his teammate. A lot of other 2026s now have a face to associate with the name brand that is Oklahoma within their cycle. And the bottom line is, like, good players want to play with good players. And Jonathan yes. Hatton, he's already considered a pretty damn good football player. So, I, yeah, like, from across the board perspective, this guy checks a lot of boxes as far as who you want to be bringing in right now as the face of your class. And I just really like him, man. He, I, I'm going to go watch him play very soon. We were talking earlier how I'm traveling all over. Yeah. That's that's one of the games I want to go watch him play. I think Cibolo Steel is going to go play like a team from California that's coming into San Antonio, speaking of travel. And that's been Ooh. one that I was, I was circling even before he committed to OU. So – I would encourage people around that area if they can to go watch him play because I just think he's an outstanding guy. Yeah, it, Captain popping in here. What's up, Cap 405? He mentioned that a guy's at seven on seven tournaments was talking about him this last spring. For some reason, StreamYard's not letting me bring comments in, so my bad I would bring you in nor normally, but it's being weird. So I digress off of that. But let's go ahead and jump into some games. Let's talk ball sure. ball. First off, I want to jump into this Iowa State get win. We beat them 50 to 30. It's a 30 point win. This is only the second time that a Matt Campbell, John Heacock defense has given up 50 plus yard, 50 plus points in a game. That's us and I think TCU last year. So this is not something that happens very often, right? This is not something that you would traditionally see. And we went out there and finally made it happen. And so last night I was on with the mainline podcast and we talked about this. If you watch my recap guys, y'all have heard me say this. I say this ad nauseum. The worst thing that happened to us and Colin, I want your opinion on this. The worst thing that, that happened to us in that game is that we got a pick six to start it off and let me explain why we got that pick six. And guess what we did? We got cocky. We were like, oh, yeah, this is going to be just as easy as we thought. Yeah. Oh, we going to walk through these mufus. And then for 21 <laughs> minutes, we all had PTSD. Because guess what we saw, like, earlier in the morning? We watched USC let Colorado come all the way back. God, mm -hmm. the PS man, PTSD was hitting your boy. So talk to me, CK. Now, after going to 39 minutes of pure just defense, how did you feel about that Iowa State victory? I think there were a couple of things that really stood out, and I'll, I'll, I'll start with this. The, the first point that you made as far as the scoring numbers on Iowa State. Well, a little quick story here just to kind of go bigger picture. That morning before the night kick between OU and Iowa State, my wife and I went to go watch Arkansas and Texas a and mm -hmm. And I can be a little bit less formal in this setting, which is a beautiful thing. So I can say this earnestly. <laughs> Dan Enos is a terrible play call. I mean, he sucks. And I'm sitting in there, and I'm like, I I can't wrap my head around how you have talents like K.J. Jefferson and Rocket Raheem Sanders and guys on the outside who have been really good receivers. And you can't – I mean, you literally cannot make a play until third down. I mean, it, yeah. Luke has – they threw him one ball, he gets hurt, and Lucas bails him out on third down, and you would have thought the sky was falling. It was like, oh, it, game's over. That, so this is what I, I wrote on, on our site. Like That was one of my primary takeaways, considering that. I left that stadium in Arlington, and I was thinking the whole way to the, the truck, like, man, people just – like they love to criticize guys like Jeff Levy, but – Damn it, if it doesn't get a lot worse in college football, especially when later that night he puts 50 points on the board, basically. I mean, yeah, there were defensive plays made, but I think, again, that offense was a big reason why they didn't collapse during that stretch when Iowa State started to make things look a little bit sweaty. And so that was one thing for me. Like, I'm watching, I'm watching Arkansas and AM, and it was just like, gosh, these two teams, man. I, this is like gross. nobody wanted to win. No. And, <laughs> and like, even when they were making plays, it was like Evan Stewart just bailing out a and when they actually throw him the football, you know? And so like, that was one thing for me. I, I wouldn't know it on our board guys. It's very easy to criticize someone like Jeff Levy when the going kind of gets rough. 
But especially after that Iowa State game, I was like, you better give that man his due when the time comes. Because credit where credit is due has to be given, even if you want to ignore it. And we don't really do that a lot in college football. The other thing with that was exactly kind of what you were talking about. I'm watching that game, and there was a stretch, and you know this. It, it goes beyond the final score, even some of the box score numbers. There was a stretch in that game where Iowa State was averaging basically more than a first down every single time they snapped the ball. Every time. And every time. I had not seen anything like it in a long time. And I'm sitting there on my couch like, this looks a little bit worse than what I'm used to. You know, and I, I think it was something where after they kind of reset and they, they gathered themselves for OU to shut things down completely in the yep. second half. That, as you mentioned, Alex Grinch is basically the sole reason why Colorado, without Travis Hunter, figured out a way to make that a game. Because no way in hell should that have been even remotely a game later in the fourth quarter. At all. And then that's that's why you brought in Brent Venables, right? Like, it's one thing if you want someone to stabilize the program who understands the stakes. But, like, for a long time, the defense in Oklahoma has kind of been seen as a joke. And for them to have that drastic of a second-half adjustment, I was thoroughly impressed. I thought that was something that you really can't overlook, especially as you get ready to play an offense like Texas. It's really tough to try to even be definitive when it comes to the word defense and our past, especially mm -hmm. when you get past about 2013. Like, I don't know that defense is a word that I would describe that we were doing out there on the field because it's just, it was, it's not, it didn't feel right. It feels kind of, mm -hmm. uh, to say yeah. that as disgusting as we were as a team, but Granted, you're right. That's why you bring in Brent Venables because you recognize, and of course, you know, last year was, you know, a cluster, but at the same time, when you add context to the entire conversation, it's no different than, of course, we got uh, my guy Friday Truth in here, who's a big Texas fan. He comes in and hangs out. You know, everybody gives him crap, but at the same time, he's very civil and we always have fun. But he knows it when Sarkeesian first got to Texas his first year, everybody was like the cupboard was bare and there wasn't much there, blah, blah, blah. Well, from there, you still had highly rated classes. They just were rated with players that were skills positions that don't do mm -hmm. much for what you're trying to do at Texas. So you've got players, just not what you really need to be right. successful long term. Same thing when BB came in. We had some five stars in some positions, but the players, the meat and potatoes you need to be successful in what we're trying to do ain't there. And so year turnover now we're figuring some stuff out we're starting to look more and more honestly kind of like texas did last year they started to get their their uh feet underneath them but they had a young quarterback we got a veteran in dylan gabriel and dylan is kind of mm -hmm. showing us now that he don't care he's giving us that moxie he's giving us that baker mayfield estique type play where he's like man y'all gonna doubt me cool let me go ahead and just go out here and try to run somebody over throw some nice touchdowns and see if people love me you know what's funny to me, C. Cato? I'm going to be honest. He goes and wins the Heisman. People still going to talk crap about him. Yeah. It don't matter at this point. <laughs> and it's bad to say, but how are you feeling about DG this week as we head right into da, 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 da. Hey Texas week? How are you feeling <laughs> about DG going into this game? I think the best way I can describe it Dylan Gabriel's really going to kind of take the Landry Jones path. You know what I mean? I, whatever this guy does, statistically, on the field, whatever, is he ever truly going to be appreciated? You know what I mean? Like, I think Landry Jones was kind of that mold, right? Some people are big Landry Jones people. There are a lot of people out there who are just like, ah, yeah. <laughs> Dylan Gabriel – I really like what he's accomplished at this point. Now, here's the biggest thing for me, though. Like, he's healthy. I, 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 I don't think we've appreciated this storyline enough. The guy is honestly not only carrying a lot of the load, basically 82% of the offense every single time he steps on the field, but, like, he's carrying the load in the run game, especially for this offense right now, and he's healthy. And for that to be the case – 
for him to look 100%. I mean, I can't detect an ounce of hurt on this guy right now. For him to be playing at the level he is while healthy going into this OU Texas game, I, I don't know that that can be understated because I, I was talking to, to Jesse Myers, the producer for Josh Payton Late Kick, about all the different angles, and we were going through all these different things. And then Pate goes live, and he's like, look, Dylan Gabriel is the single most important player on that field come Saturday. And it's 100% correct. I mean, I agree. How am I feeling about Dylan Gabriel? I feel like that's the guy who ultimately decides this game once we kick it off at 11 a.m. Because if he comes out there, even if Quinn Ewers, for example, isn't at his best, Texas is going to have the defense and some playmakers around him who can elevate him in that situation. At the end of the day, when you especially consider some of the stuff that's going on around Dylan that I'm sure we'll talk about, it's him or nothing. And so I, I'm thoroughly excited about what he's accomplished to this point. I think, again, it's being, it's being very taken for granted. We continue to talk about how Oklahoma fans are wildly spoiled within the context of offensive football and quarterback play in general in this sport. But especially with Dylan Gabriel having the year he's had while healthy, you really cannot take for granted this guy every time he steps out on the field and basically wills OU to win no matter the situation. I agree. And that's kind of what I was thinking about when C and DG play, thinking about how, um, how, like you said, you, I think you summed it up perfectly. We're spoiled. We're just spoiled. And it's, it's like Texas fans. They're spoiled with running backs, right? Like you get Bijans, you get Ricky Williams, you get uh, Cedric Benson's, you get, you're so spoiled. With, like right now, Jonathan Brooks is looking like he may follow that lineage if he continues to play the way he does. I don't see it this season, but next season he's going to be a super threat because he's going to grow from it. But you're used to that. That's who you are. And for us, it's been quarterback play. Heisman Trophy candidates every single year. And so now we're preparing ourselves to go up against Texas. We're going up against the number three team in the country. And everyone says we don't have a chance unless you're a Sooner fan. Sooner fans, of course, we always got a chance because we know one thing is always true. The Red River rivalry don't care. They don't care where you ranked. They don't care who on your team. Something happens. It always ends up that way. And so when I'm watching this and I'm looking at it, we got Quinn Ears, which I don't have beef with Quinn, but I know that there's flaws there. I think that he has a great arm talent, he feels like your traditional college quarterback that's a great one, but just doesn't get it to the next level. What's your thoughts about what the Sooners need to do to contain a guy like Quinn? There's a lot. I think one big deciding factor, not just for Quinn, but this game in general, is Jatavian Sanders' health. I, I, I know he's day-to-day, -day, but... I would expect Jutavian to play. Texas and Oklahoma both have a bye week after this game, and I believe the next game for Texas after this one would be a game against Houston. So, like, Jutavian would be able to rest. And why do I bring that up? Well, Jutavian and Quinn are, like, best friends at UT. They, they do all these different events together. I believe they're roommates, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, on top of their relationship – Jatavian is Quinn's go-to guy. When, when all is failing, one thing you can lean on if you're Quinn Ewers is the talent who you know and the talent that is elite. I mean, Jatavian, if Brock Bowers weren't in this upcoming NFL draft class, Jatavian's the number one tight end taken off the board, which is kind sense. of wild to think about. And I think Jatavian Sanders is someone who – especially with Justin Harrington not out there, Oklahoma does not match up well against that guy, just flat out. And so for Quinn, number one, you got to figure out an account for Jatavian Sanders if he's out there or not. But let's say in a hypothetical, you're covering Jatavian well or he's not out there. The biggest thing for me in this game is Quinn's ability to step in there and not just be consistent or whatever, because I think he has, like you mentioned, really good arm talent. Right. You look at Quinn Ewers, and like one thing that people, some people know about me is I'm a big NFL draft nerd. I enjoy scouting these players. I enjoy applying them within the context of the NFL. And I just flat out love college football. And so watching tape on all these different talents in the sport's a lot of fun for me. 
But when I turn on the tape with Quinn, and there are a lot of NFL scouts who have spoken to this, by the way. Quinn, the one thing you need to know about him is his throwing motion is drastically different than what you will see most of the time in college football. In fact, there are a lot of people in the game who are like, how on earth did he get coached to throw that way? And on top of that, how has he not changed? And so when you think about the context of the throwing motion in this contest, I have to see Oklahoma force Quinn Ewers to complete like the deep ball, for example. If you're going to let Quinn dink and dunk, he is elite in the short to intermediate game. And there are times where he'll take the field on a Saturday and be dominant from a stretching the field perspective. But as we all know, I think even Texas fans would agree, and as someone for me who's watching these games, Quinn, when he is at his inconsistent type of self, he's not hitting the deep shots. And so you cannot let that be something that Texas is doing well against you if you're Oklahoma. And that's why I want to see if Quinn shows up and he's not just consistent or playing a high level. Because my thing with Quinn is he shows up for every big game. Right, you got to worry about Quinn more when you're playing Rice or Wyoming or whatever. Yeah, you got to worry about Quinn when you're playing Alabama or Oklahoma. I just need to see how is he doing at all three levels of the field because my my gut feeling is on Saturday he's going to be elite at levels one and two. But if Oklahoma is allowing him to be elite at level three, I mean, go ahead and wrap it up. You know what I mean? The game's done. Yeah, it's a done deal. And I'm looking at his numbers now with that. Yeah, he. He's one for four from the deep out left, three for 11 in the middle, and 0 for four outright. Anything past 20 yards. That's just not what. And the thing is, he can throw a pretty one. And I'll give it to Sarkeesian. They recognize the, the, the chink in the armor with Alabama was you got Caleb Downs keep coming up to that line of scrimmage. You got a freshman yep. in his second college game ever. And what does he do? Make mistakes. So, you know, the you know, the viewers here heard me say it ad nauseum. I don't like freshmen in certain positions playing early because in the first couple of games, they're going to make the mistakes that you're going to be like, why did you do that? Oh, duh, you're a freshman. You're still learning. You're still understanding. But guess what? They end up coming back weeks later as they develop that experience. They're a difference maker. And so let's talk about this run game now. I mean – that's probably the one thing I'm most terrified about in this game, right? Yeah. We don't have anybody established as the number one. So we got to ask the question. It begs the question, will we get a number one? Is there anybody on this team that is worthy to be the number one that we can rely on going into this game to be the one that takes over? Yeah, and that's a, the big thing is, is I don't know that Oklahoma – and Tom Green wrote about this for us at Sooners Illustrated. Again, go sign up if you haven't already, two months for a dollar. But Tom Green wrote, traditionally, whoever wins this game has been able to run the ball effectively. And if we're being honest, I don't think OU runs the ball that well right now. I mean, even over this past weekend, and I had noted it going into the Iowa State game, that was a game where I felt like OU's run game really had to go improve it because the year prior – Oh, you struggled to throw the ball on Iowa State. And you can talk about how all that team was different, but Eric Gray goes for more than 100 yards and they end up winning the game. And Iowa State's whole defensive basis, that whole rush three drop eight that revolutionized college football, we're not going to let you hit the explosive play. Well, keeping that in mind, I was like, this has to be the game where OU figures it out. And not only did they not, (laughs) it was basically Dylan Gabriel or bust. I ran the numbers afterwards, and the three running backs who took the field on Saturday for Oklahoma averaged three and a half yards per carry. Now, if you know anything about football, you know four yards is like where you're okay with things because four yards is what my offensive coordinator used to say is a productive play. Now, I kind of think that's BS, but, man, if you aren't hitting the four-yard mark on a a carry per down basis, that's not good when you're going to play this Texas front seven. and. This is the thing, too. It's one thing if, like, you're going into this game and, like, the offensive line isn't completely figured out as a starting five or, like, maybe your running back's a little bit dinged up. No, they they have just made all of this a complete problem. And there are rotations going on in the front five, so it's not even, like, chemistry is, is being built still. Like, even some of OU's best 
offensive lines we're still figuring out going into this Texas game. They just have kind of thrown out whoever they like that week at running back. The offensive line, whether it's health or who's actually playing well, is, is out there. And against all these Texas defensive linemen and linebackers, I mean, I don't really know how you feel great about that aspect of this matchup going into it. And I look, I would love to be pleasantly surprised, but I don't know how the hell you figure that out in seven days or less. Yeah, unless they have just some, you know, some rabbit coming out their behinds that there's just secretly been holding on to this entire time. I don't see it either. I just think that we're going to try. We're going to we're going to push and then we're going to continue to do what we do is and throw. And I think Sarkeesian and PK over there at Texas is prepared for that. They have I bet PK's thinking, "Okay, we probably can go ahead and go 3-3-5 in this game and let them try to run and focus on their passes because as we get to the wide receivers, man, we got a pretty freaking legit wide receiver room. Like our wide receiver room is actually really good. And it's funny. I've said this in my recap. I know people have heard me say this. We need to give Emmett Jones a raise. Uh, you may hear this randomly throughout the rest of this broadcast, but we need to give Emmett Jones a raise because I think he's given us the best room on this team. Looking at these receivers, my God, what, how did Jaden Gibson learn how to catch so strongly? Like, where did this come from? <laughs> no, I, no, I, there's so many things you could bring up and be like, how the hell is this happening right now? But from what was arguably one of the biggest question marks going into the season to I think I'm right there with you. I don't know of a better room, obviously, outside of a one-man position at quarterback. I don't know of a better position group at Oklahoma right now than the wide receivers. You can try to tell me, but I feel like I'd have a counter argument to every single aspect of the team besides right. the receivers. And going into this contest, like Dylan Gabriel to me is the deciding factor, the one most important player for OU. But that then feeds into getting the best players on the field the ball, right? And I think if Oklahoma has the ability to do so, that opens things wide up. And another part of this too is like, Texas secondary is really good. I, I really like some of those guys back there for UT. John A. Barron's really talented. Anyone who has followed Jalen Catalan in college football, I mean, I adore that guy. Yes. And he's a head hunter, but he's had issues staying healthy. They, to this point, have been relatively solid across the board from a health perspective. And if all those Texas guys are out there, then this is going to be, you know, what is it? immovable force of the stoppable object, that type of nonsense. Like, yep. Now, I think a big key, and I mentioned this to, to Jesse and Pate, Ryan Watt's health is huge because I think the best player in that receiver room, overall talent, is Nick Anderson. Now, agreed. I think Andrew Anthony is your best wide receiver right now, but the best pure talent is Nick Andrew Anderson. Anderson. And at six foot four, 200 plus pounds, I don't know of a lot of other corners who match up well with him, like Ryan Watts, who is about six foot three, 200 pounds, long arms. I mean, that's the dream matchup for you if you're Texas. If Ryan Watts isn't out there, that's another really big aspect of this that you have to consider on the Oklahoma side of the equation because it's probably going to open things up for you, whether you're trying to target Nick Anderson or whoever you throw out there on that side of the field, right? I look at these receivers and I say, I'm, I'm not even considering them a storyline because to me, they're the most known commodity of this Oklahoma football team. I think we all kind of know they're the most known commodity. Now, I'll tell you this. There are a lot of folks outside of the world of Oklahoma football that whether they're reporters or fans who don't know these guys. But I think that's I think, honestly, if you don't know who Jaleel Farouk and Andrew Anthony and Nick Anderson, all these guys are, you just don't watch football. And that's right. fine. Like, there are a lot of folks in my industry who don't watch football, and that's okay. Um, but at the end of it all, I, I think, again, you, you can you can tell I'm trying to be a little sarcastic here. At the right. end of it all, it really comes down to me what is happening around those guys because, again, the receiver room is not going to be an issue come Saturday morning. No, I 100% agree. And Ryan Watts is is they, they're going to need him to keep up with Nick. Nick at Nick at Nick's size and speed and what he's showing that he can do, 
His route running has dramatically improved too. Like we knew that him and Gibson coming in together, there was something there. They both talk about they're going to be a tandem. They're going to be the top wide receiver combo in the country. That's their goal. And now we're starting to see it. Like, like Emmett Jones needs a raise because he's unlocked that out of them. And we're like, because everybody was, of course, nervous about Jaden Gibson after he showed the yips last year with all them drop passes. And you're like, man, is he ever going to get it? 6'5". He also runs like a 4'4", 4'5", 4'5", depending on the day of the week. He's fast. He's long. But, man, he just can't get the ball in his hands. Now he's doing like, like, like grown man catches. Like he's like literally catching it and running people over. And so – him, Andrew Anthony, which was probably the biggest surprise of us all. I knew he'd be good, but geez, Louise, he's he's our top wide receiver. And it's yeah. funny because as you focus on Andrew, you you you're missing out on Farouk, who should be our best receiver, while at the same time going to Nick Anderson. And I haven't even touched on the slot guys at all. But when you talk about uh Jalen uh, Catalan, it I think I see him and I see Reggie Pearson as the same dude. And that was Pearson's problem, you know. Tech, Wisconsin, he lived on the injury. Every other game he had to be out because he hit people too hard. And now he's out because he's hitting people hard. But at the same time, we'll see Reggie in this game. We'll see Catalan in this game anticipating. I'm pretty excited to see who who who's gonna be uh who's gonna lay the hammer the hardest. But let's move on to the defensive side. Both both teams defensive line, I think their interior is probably their best, but at the same time. Do you think that Texas interior line or line as a unit is better than Cincinnati's? Because I, I arguably Cincinnati with uh, Juwan Briggs as well as uh, Dante Corleone, the Godfather, might have the best defensive line in the, in, in, in the Big Twelve. I'm going to say Texas gets the slight advantage, okay. but only because I think my here's my thing with it. Cincinnati arguably has some of the the higher draftable prospects in Briggs and Corleone, Before, this is my thing. Tamandre Sweat is a Sunday player. No, no doubt about it. He is a game wrecker for his size and ability to be the talent he is. It is not common in today's college football. Byron Murphy is a kid who I have been following for a long time, since his days at DeSoto. And that is, that is a Dallas-Fort Worth fan favorite. I don't care who you were a fan of as a college football team or who your favorite high school squad was. Byron Murphy's a dude. And from there, like, you go – Alfred Collins is another guy who I, – I think all three of those guys are Sunday players. I look at Ethan Burke. I look at Baron Sorrell. I look at Justice Fink. I, I look at some of these other players they have in that room. And the thing with, with Cincinnati or even SMU, those were, like, four-man fronts that gave OU fits. And I don't right. think that they had the talent-to-depth ratio that Texas does. And mm. to circle back on your point earlier, I mean, you said it yourself. Texas has finally been recruiting the guys you need <laughs> rather than the guys you want. Well, they're all they're all right there on the depth chart. I'm looking at them on one of my monitors. So I, I look, I, I got to bring back your original point because you're a smart guy, but that's why I'm saying this Texas defensive front is the defensive line that's going to be the biggest challenge for Oklahoma that they will see flat out until arguably postseason play. Like, I think Texas defensive front is really damn good, and it's going to be a, quite the challenge for these offensive line. No, I agree with you with, with that. And and the only reason why I mentioned Cincinnati is everybody knows in, in looking at the draft reports and the conversations, right now it's literally Dante Corleone, Juwan Briggs. Corleone's considered a first-round pick. Um, I think Texas may have one up there, but Juwan Briggs is also – another um, day two guy at minimum is what the anticipation is. Just because of just how talented they've played, especially in the 3-3-5, they're still getting, causing problems and wrecking havoc. But Texas is. They've, they've finally started recruiting. They've got young guys on that defensive line, and they're they're playing with urgency. And so I think that's probably the position that I'm probably the most nervous about, if anything, is um, seeing what we look like going against their defensive line and – blocking more so on the run game. I have, I have no concerns on the pass game. I think our pass blocking is good enough to get Dylan Gabriel time to get passes to where he needs to get them, or at least for him to at least step back and just launch that thing. So either Brennan Thompson, Brennan Thompson or uh, Jaquez Petaway can just run underneath it, or G-Freaky can run underneath it and just go score a touchdown. But 
Our D line though has done a really good job of cre- getting pressure to the point that we're forcing teams to throw the ball within three seconds of snaps. Now I right. don't anticipate that at all from Texas. I actually expect Quinn to hold the ball a bit more. He's got he's been sacked nine times this season, and I and to me I'll keep it a buck. I do consider most sacks a quarterback stat, and not a stat on the mm-hmm. offensive line because it's usually the quarterback holding the ball too long. Yeah. But and in this case, their line's actually pretty good. They've been recruiting well. You think that this defensive line and mixture of linebackers, you think we can get the pressure on Quinn we need to make him make mistakes? I think this is arguably one of the top three biggest aspects of this game, right? Like Oklahoma's defensive line that has been questioned, though talented, against Texas offensive line and Quinn which I would say wildly talented, but also at times they've been questioned. And I I look at that group, right? My thing with Texas and that offensive line, they're really good. I've covered a lot of those guys in high school. I have a lot of faith in their natural ability. But even beyond the starting five, Texas has a couple of other options on the bench who can come in and sub if things aren't going well up front. Right. However, as we know, OU has found a way to build up competitive depth to the point where they probably feel they go, what, eight deep, nine deep maybe? I mean, it's it's gotten a lot better than it used to be. Fair. And so I think when you look at that specific matchup, whether it's in the context of the run game or the pass game, I need to see OU's defensive front with this actually, I think you hit the nail on the head, actually a potential opportunity to close on the quarterback rather than facing three-step drops on a consistent basis. Can you deliver? Because I think P.J. Adewale can. I think R. Mason Thomas can if he's healthy. I think guys like Rondell Bothroyd and Ethan Downs, when they're going and they're operating at full capacity, they can get there. And I think guys like Jordan Kelly have flashed over the points of this season. There, there are names in there who are not just names, if yeah. that makes sense. Now, can they be names who are showing up consistently on the stat sheet? There's an opportunity probably to do so, both in the run game and in the pass game. So Oklahoma's defensive line is going to have to deliver because not only are they facing a really good offensive line for Texas, but Jonathan Brooks is a hell of a talent. And Quinn Ewers is going to be back there arguably a little bit too long. you got to go and make those plays. Yeah, no, you're right. And it's 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 interesting seeing PJ go out there as a freshman and, you know, BB telling Chavis, hey, man, we need to play this guy more. And he's like, well, he played the second most snaps. Oh, OK. Um, I guess we can we find more more time for him because he's he's that freak. And I think it'll be fun seeing him versus Banks uh, for Texas matched up. That's going to be that. Our Mason Thomas you mentioned he'll be he'll be back. That to me is very intriguing. And my bad, Hank, you're right. You're supposed to drink anytime you say competitive depth to become a drinking game. <laughs> I normally have something on me. I, I'm used to doing our podcast as Super Illustrated with a coffee cup, and it's like <laughs> 6 30 at night. So I would be a serial killer if I had a cup of coffee with me that, right now. But. That's true. I'm not sure if your wife would want you to be a serial killer for the day. But yeah, no, we have, we, we have competitive depth, which is impressive. The thing that we've been looking for, the thing that we've yeah. been wanting, the thing that we begged for as Sooner fans, our offense has always got it, defense not. Now, linebackers, Stutzman's that dude right now. Stutzman has got to be in the top five for the Buckets Award right now. He he should be up there for all the defensive yeah. awards that you can get because just how much of a field general he's being. I got to ask you this, though. We know Stutzman's cool. Listening to what uh, Sarkeesian said in his presser, talking about how he knows that the BV defense is always at that linebacker that's going to be key that you got to pay attention to. You see them focusing a lot of time on Canick, who has been kind of hot and cold as a young linebacker in college football. Look, I'm obsessed with Steve Sarkeesian play calling. So if there's one thing I know about this guy, he's going to have a fire opening script. and He's going to stay the hell away from Danny Stutzman. Those are the two things I know that Sark's talking about in his meeting, right? He's going to have a couple of really good plays right on that first drive, and the rest of the way he's going to call it by his heart, but he's going to say 28's not going to come near the football. Now, I don't think that's going to be possible. 
right? But nope. you, you get what I'm saying. He's If there is someone out there, especially with Harrington being down, like I mentioned, they're going to go to that side of the field. Now, I'll tell you this, though. Real they're going to test McCullough. You're right. I, I think McCullough is the test. I think Canick's the test. I do want to mention real quick, as we transition from frontline play to the linebackers, two things I'm thinking about. P.J. Adeboare, the freshman, against Kelvin Banks, exactly like you mentioned. Anthony Hill on third down, dropping down as the edge rusher, taking on Walter Rouse. I'm just saying that is an aspect of this game that you might see that a lot of fans out there are going to forget about, but if it's out there, you know Anthony Hill. That's a dude, and Walter Rouse, you're not going to pick on Tyler Guy. No. Walter Rouse is going to have to come to play against that guy who had, what, two sacks against Alabama, something like that. Anyway, as we go back to the linebackers, Texas has Jalen Ford, Anthony Hill, Dave Gabenda, all really talented players. OU's linebacker core took a hit when Harrington went down. That dude was balling out. He was. I think, again, not just within the context of this game, I think Justin Harrington is the exact player you would, would have wanted covering Jatavian Sanders if he's healthy. Harrington's also the guy that, honestly, you would want to balance out the defense with Danny Sutzman. And I think McCullough and Canick, we're about to find out if they're up for the test. And so it, I know a lot of people will talk about Jaron Canick, right? And I've already – I actually saw some Twitter buzz about him before I was getting ready to hop on the show. Like, yeah, I understand, but I would also kind of hope you maybe see some Kip Lewis snaps in here because I think he probably fits really well how you want to counteract the Steve Sarkeesian offense. Desan McCullough is going to have to come to play because if he doesn't, what are we talking about, Peyton Bowen or Reggie Pearson stepping down into the cheetah spot? And that's – Samuel Sego, yeah. yeah. I, I, oh, oh, actually, Kendall Dolby was playing Cheetah over the last uh, few games too. So, yeah, we we're, we're, or we're just going into a nickel, but we're we're we've got a lot of options. I, look, it's and, and you're spot on with it for McCullough. It's you can tell he's learning the position for the first time. Like mm-hmm. he's being asked a lot more than he did in Indiana. Indiana, he was an edge rusher basically, and he just rushed that bad boy, and he was very successful doing it in the Big Ten, which is a conference infamous for having really good offensive linemen. Like you go yeah. look at the NFL roster, a lot of those players came from Big Ten teams. That that's a very common thing. Big Ten from um, Oregon, they always randomly got an offensive lineman. Oklahoma, Texas, occasionally puts him one here or there, but in Alabama and Georgia, but Big Ten teams fill them up. Mm-hmm. McCullough was killing it there. He was doing really good as a freshman. And so now this year he's learning you got to do coverage while also being able to rush or just playing in space. And the good thing for him is he's huge at what, six foot five. He's he's probably realistically 240, 250 now. He's probably 250 now. And he's still fast. It looks like he's making up for what he misses with his length. Like that wingspan is absurd. And just watching yeah. him move, I'm like, okay. You're st- you're still a matchup problem, unless someone can find a way to get around you. And so I'm curious to see the passes that Quinn throws his direction, if he can get them over his head. That's yeah. the thing that I want to see. And the question is going to be what those routes are going to look like, and are we willing to hit? So it leads us into the secondary now, right? Reggie should Reggie's healthy. He'll be playing. We know yeah. we're gonna see the freshman Peyton Bowen. You got to put him out there. Billy Bowman is having one of his best seasons. I mean, he's getting he's pick sixes really well. and such. He's playing yeah. really well. And the best thing for me is Woody Washington is not being tested right now. Teams have decided that he's not. We're not going to his side of the field. He is close to having a Dion effect right now, where he's shutting down almost half. He's shutting down his lane of the field so far. Not half the field. We're prime. It was half the field. You weren't going to. Past the center, you weren't looking that direction because you knew that prime was there. But Woody is lining up at that. Matchup-wise, and in Gentry Williams, who's been tested and is showing that it's a bad idea. Worthy Cooks, wide receiver room for Texas against those corners. What's that matchup look like to you? I, I think it's I think it's another, I mean, arguably a deciding factor in this game, right? Like, how do you make Quinn Ewer's life easy? If you're wide open and I I think you look at Texas wide receiver core, if you wanted to tell me it's the best room in college football, 
I would at least like to hear the argument, all right? Because you mentioned Xavier Worthy. I, I think that guy is really talented. And he also, on top of being a talented player, like Xavier Worthy shows up for the big games. That's what I love about that guy is even though he can be a little bit of a pencil and there are times where it's hard to get him the football, it does not matter. If he's going to get a target in a big game, he makes the most of it every single time. Jordan Whittington, chain mover, big playmaker, clutch moment kind of guy. But Jonte Cook coming in as a freshman, he's shown now that he can be a reliable option. I personally believe a little hot take here for you on the show. And this is something I've kind of told people behind the scenes, and it's actually been fortified from what I've heard from folks that I trust. A.D. Mitchell is going to get drafted higher than Xavier Worthy. And yes. It, he might be the best receiver in that room, even with Xavier Worthy in there. And there are going to be a lot of Oklahoma fans, believe it or not, you know them probably, who don't know who A.D. Mitchell is. Because even when he was at, like, Georgia, I think he got nine targets all year at one point. This guy is legitimately someone who, like, NFL scouts are salivating over. And since his yeah. time – with Texas, he has delivered and then some. And so it's like, it's not that you got to face Xavier Worthy or Jordan Whittington, like you knew those guys. It's not that like you got to face a really talented John Tay Cook who's a freshman or, or whatever. Amy Mitchell takes this room to a whole other level because if you want to tell me there's three guys who are going to strut out there besides Jatavian Sanders, if he's healthy, who are playing on Sundays. I, and then you factor in John Tay Cook's a freshman who I think is going to play a, in Sundays as well. I don't hate the take that it's arguably one of the best in all of college football. So I need to see what OU's defensive backs look like, right? Like the quick game stuff is 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 something to consider here because the whole nature of a lot of opposing offenses is we got to get this ball out fast, we got to get it to somebody's hands, and we're going to see what happens next. And for the most part. Because Oklahoma's defensive backs are so well coached, they they click and close in the blink of an eye. And yeah. they're very good at play recognition. But Steve Sarkeesian, the whole basis of the scheme is going to mislead you. And so Woody Washington, like you mentioned, has not been tested. I would be stunned if Sark doesn't try to test that guy. See if he's still on his heels a little bit. Gentry Williams, we're about to find out. You know what I mean? Are, are you about it? Like, yeah. <laughs> There's going to be a first from pick type of across the street from you. Are you coming to play? And so I don't know, man. I mean, it's there are a lot of aspects of this matchup that fascinate me, and I think this is one where I'm like, I have no idea what to expect because Oklahoma's defensive backs could show up and play well, and I'd be like, yep. Or Texas wide receivers could dominate one way or another. It's going to be really fun to watch. Yeah, it's going to probably be it's 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 going to be game of the season and. As mentioned by a few people in the comment section, the anticipation is we see each other again. This isn't our one time. We're going to see each other twice. Yeah, we both should run right through the conference, uh, barring injury, knock on wood. We run right back into each other, and that's my anticipation as well. But a question pop, pop up from my boy Steven. Colin, you think Harrington's waiver request will be approved since, you know, he had knee surgery and he's done? How you, what you thinking? I'll tell you, this is a great question from Steven because the NCAA is – I really want to curse right now. Um, <laughs> it, it's its doing its thing, right? I mean – It's doing the thing that it I does, would, yes. I, I, you've seen a lot of wave of denials by the NCAA recently, but for the most part, that's been about transfers. And while I would argue that the stakes are still similar because – a lot of these guys are moving around because of family health issues and the NCAA just decides, oh, we're going to screw all these kids over like we normally do. I digress. I think Harrington's going to get approved. I, I would be pretty stunned, especially considering the fact that even prior to this year, he had some, some health concerns and things like that. I would assume the NCAA recognizes it, sees that it happened, what, within the first four games of the year. So like a quote unquote red shirt effect is in, is in place and, I would assume that he gets granted an extended year of eligibility. And if he doesn't, I mean, it's another travesty from one of the worst organizations in the world. Sounds about right. I just saw, and, and, and glad you mentioned that. Let, let's jump really quick into the last topic before I let you enjoy the rest of your evening is um, 
So the NCAA made some rules changes, and I noticed that Nicole Albach just posted a tweet. Love Nicole over at the Athletic, and I think she does something else now. But love Nicole, great She's reporter. Great. Yeah. She points out that they're banning photo shoots at unofficial visits, only unofficials. Only unofficials. Why? Because if we are not going to instill things like serious transfer portal windows and actual vacation time for college staffs, this is probably the next best thing. Now, I know this is like serving up what, one of those little Christmas trees or like a really sad looking cake and being like, here's your present, figure it out. But the bottom line here is it kind of seems silly and I get it. But you got to think about it. One of our major issues right now in college football is that coaches are just flat out getting worn out over, I mean, I'm just going to say it, really dumb stuff that we have to deal with now in this sport. And I think this is one way to sort of alleviate some unnecessary pressure because I'm just going to tell you right now, there are a lot of college coaches who just flat out don't like the fact that they have to organize a whole bunch of meaningless photo shoots Honestly, at times for guys who are just flat out there for the Instagram picture. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, that makes sense. I'd be kind of upset, too. And so I think it's actually a pretty reasonable move by the NCAA. And I like the fact that they're finally looking out for people in the sport because, I mean, I think we're directly headed towards a path where, like, I'm not saying it, him exactly, but, like, a Kirby Smart just decides to wake up one day and hang it up. Because in college football, it's well documented. These guys, these guys can't sleep. If you if you nap for two hours, someone's somebody ahead. steals your recruit. <laughs> Someone steals your own player. You know what I mean? Like you gotta you gotta recruit your own roster every single day. And so yeah, tampering is consistent. This is not something that alleviates every issue in college football, but it's at least something that sort of frees up some scheduling for college coaches to worry about other pressing matters. And that's very fair. Like, I, like I'm like i not even mad about that thought because you're right. That is the one thing I did notice about coaching in co at the college ranks is there is no vacation. There is no time off for the most part. You're recruiting guys from January to January. It's nonstop. And then when you bring them on your own team, you're in a way trying to recruit them to stay because – there's a good chance they may consider leaving because, oh, I'm not getting enough playing time, so I'm going to go play somewhere else. And Or at the same time, this is the thing I always remind everybody, coaches be processing these kids out too. Sometimes yeah. they the kids' choice. Sometimes they just like, hey, I got another kid that's better than you in the portal coming, and I'm unfortunately you not going to get no more look, games, so we're going to have to let you go. Look, man, this benefits a lot of people besides obviously the recruits, but also look at it from a, a, a fan perspective. Y'all have to follow less people on Twitter now. You know, you're you're not going to see any any slaps on the TL being like, how did this kid end up in an Oklahoma uniform? You know, do I need to follow this kid? I know for me too, it's going to be a blessing because I'm not going to have to figure out was this guy along for the ride or are we actually looking at him on the board? So anyway, that's just that's just another silver lining for a rule that I think actually kind of makes some sense. No, that makes sense. Yeah, and and I know at a certain point we're going to start they're going to start limit they're going to start limiting like. Um, now that's the that's the last one. How do you think this is going to come down after this season? Because right now it's unlimited recruits you can take. It used to always be twenty five, which made things more manageable. You can pick the players you want to go after and focus. But mm. we opened it up because of the portal. Now they're reducing the dates for the portal. Yeah. What 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 number do you think it's going to be for recruits at that point? Because I know a lot of these coaches like BV. Saban, your bigger name ones, Kirby, they prefer to get recruits over transfers and use the transfer portal as just little fill-ins where they need it instead of using the entire portal as a band-aid like Coach Prime did this year, which he had to. Your team's 111, yeah. you got to do it. How many players you think they're going to try to reduce it to at that point? I mean, my thing with it is I do think that in order to contend – for national titles, the portal has to be a part of your roster building structure. Yep. And I mean, if you look at this Oklahoma team, it kind of slaps you in the face with the evidence, right? Fair. Even Texas, who's getting ready to obviously face Oklahoma, a lot of portal guys out there for the Longhorns too. You have Danny to. Danny Mitchell. <laughs> yeah. Like, at the end of the day, though, programs like Oklahoma 
in Texas and Alabama, so on and so forth. Okay, I'll put it this way. Everybody in the SEC that Oklahoma's getting ready to face, OU included, I don't think they're really worried about that much. You know, I mean, even like Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Ole Miss is a program largely built on transfers. But I think even they, they would tell you we'd rather get a lot of recruits in the house. Yep. Now, for the Kansas States of the world, who are let's talk, let's call them consistent powers, but cannot lean on high school recruiting the way Oklahoma can, like the portal has to be a big part of your equation, right? If you're going to continue to win the way that you win, and I think Kansas State is a hell of a program. I mean, even even that staff has admitted on the record in the past they saved like 15 scholarships minimum for the portal at this point because you have to. And yeah. I, I think it's it's going to force a lot of programs to look in the mirror. I, I think that's the biggest storyline. It doesn't come down to numbers. It's how many numbers do you need in order to be a consistent winner? And that's not a exact science, but it's something you're going to have to figure out as a program very quickly because as we figure out things like transfer portal windows, which you mentioned, we're getting ready for basically college football free agency soon. Yes, so sir. how are you going to attack the market? If you know you need quantity, you also need quality, but the quality is ended up at places like Oklahoma and Texas and Alabama. That's where yeah, I think the, the transfer portal equation kicks in rather than for OU and Texas and, and programs of that nature, if that makes sense. No, that makes sense. The, we're not a program that's going to – like this year we were pretty reliant on it because we need to replace 82% of the players that we had before to where we can compete at the level we need to compete. Now it's looking like we're we're doing well with all these transfers, and I it still saddens me that we got zero Clemson players because BV refused to take them. That still to this moment hurts my heart that he just would do those kids that way. Why would you not let them come to a better program? But I digress. Yeah. CK, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you for pulling up. For everybody, in the description below, get two months of 24-7 at Sooner Illustrated for a buck. The link is in the description. Colin Kennedy writes some of the best stuff over there. My man, thank you so much for pulling up. Appreciate you having me, man. Yeah, go subscribe. You get SoonersIllustrated.com, the message board. You get complete access to all of 24-7 sports. That means everything from Steve Wiltfong articles to – what is Horns 24-7 today? So it's a really cool opportunity that we're running from Red River Week. I encourage you Oklahoma fans to come join us over there. I know you're on there as well. So, I mean, this guy is a brilliant face of that message. Too. <laughs> Look, it's a great time, but it's always a great time being here on the show, man. It's always fun when we get to talk ball. I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you. We'll get you back here in November with all that traveling you're doing, man. I'm going to make sure I don't pull you too much. We're going we to get you back in November, but right before the season ends. So we'll make that happen. But everybody, thank y'all for pulling up as usual. Um, if you haven't already, wipe your feet before you you know leave the house this time. Since you didn't wipe your feet when you came in, hit that like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe and join the family. And with that, we'll chop it up. I actually, I'll be back on here in about 20 minutes with all the Texas folks. Ew. We'll talk soon. <laughs> Hey, they kill us though. Y'all do it great. <laughs>